Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again today and welcome back to those of you though uh, those of you who were here yesterday for our discussion about David Ignatius's new book The Paladin with Richard Clark and David Ignatius himself. I want you to know that between yesterday and today we're joined by people from all over the world from the Netherlands, South Africa, Palestine, UK, Germany, Canada, Italy, Poland and today Norway because our speaker is in Oslo. And I am so happy to be able to bring us all today, Thomas Heghammer, who just as a little you know, aside, I wanna say before I introduce you formally, used to be a fellow at the center in one of its earlier incarnations. So welcome. I'm so proud of you for this book. It's, it's actually amazing. So we're Thank here you. today to talk with Thomas Heghammer, Senior Research Fellow at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment, a think tank, um, and adjunct professor of political science at the University of Oslo. Um, and I want to say, I, before we get into the book, I just want to say this seems to me to be your magnum opus. It, how many years did it take you to write this book? Um, from the very beginning until publication, it was 13 years. Um, so if, if, That's a long uh, like time. To, yeah, so um, a friend once said uh, that he it was so nice to see the book because he knew it when it was little. Um, <laughs> no, but it, 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 it's beautifully written. And so I, sometimes Thank I you. think that people who spend too much time writing something, it gets more and more um, dense and less and less easy to read. But this is not like that. This just flows. So whatever you did in terms of how you put this together, um, it's, it's a guide, guide for all of us. So the book is entitled The Caravan, uh, and it's uh, about Abdullah Azam and the rise of global jihad. And Azam is one of those names that gets tossed around a lot in the um, scholarly community, in the expert community. And, and um, so there are two things. One, tell us just a little bit about Azam, just a one-liner. But then what I really want to start this conversation with is, why did you choose to write a biography and why Azam and sort of those two things if you could riff on them for our listeners sure well first of all thanks so much for, for having me this is a huge pleasure um, uh, of course it would have been even better to be in New York with you um, agreed but uh, but uh, I'm very happy that we could do this instead um, so yes um, Azam I consider him sort of the founding father of the transnational jihadi movement. Um, it was he who led the mobilization of foreign fighters to Afghanistan in the 1980s. And in doing so, he created the sort of, the, 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 the community from which all, all the other groups, all the subsequent groups like Al Qaeda, et cetera, emerged from. So he kind of, he, he built the cradle from which transnational jihadism emerged. So um, he, he's, a, he's a very, very influential figure and he's also celebrated to this day. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to the fact that he was killed in 1989, but uh, he, he's quite, an ex it's extraordinary in that sense that, that he's been dead for a very long time and, and yet is very widely read. Um, right, and, and he wrote a lot. And that, that's also the interesting thing in this day and age of social media and recruitment and radicalization and, and ideological transfer via you know, some kind of virtual or social media or something experience. Whereas a lot of what people knew about him is that they read him, is that correct? Yeah, so I mean, that's one of the reasons why it took me so long to write this book, is that he, he just produced so much that I had to go through. Um, also, he, he wrote excessively. He, he wrote um, short, uh, accessible books. You know, they were literally like, you know, five millimeters uh, thick, small, things that, you know, you could just pick up from the corner store. Um, you know, and carry with you uh, almost anywhere. And it was written, you know, you know, in a clear language, you know, very explicit, you know, tackling the kind of the key political issues of the time head on, no kind of beating around the bush. Um, 
so that I think appealed to to many people. Um, and also later on, especially with the rise of the internet, he became a meme. He he, he became right. his 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 picture features in thousands of, of kind of photo montages and memes. So a bit like Che Guevara does to the left. So it's his face is a trademark. Um, and you have all these, you know, memes and kind of um, montages with his quotes as well. He's kind of like the sort of the, uh, his, his words are almost scriptures in their own right. And, you know, these the, uh, Al-Qaeda and IS sympathizers kind of, they trade Azam quotes, as it were. So he, he, he really is considered a sort of a, fo a foundational figure. He's, he's the Ur person, you know, in this, in this conversation. But one person that you deal with very well, and I just, I, I think our listeners will be very interested is, is Saeed Qutub. And how, I mean, he, where does his thought in terms of mentoring and guidance um, fit in with the evolution of Azam? Right. So Said Qutb, as many um, viewers will, will know, was an Egyptian member of the Muslim Brotherhood who uh, had a big influence on the Islamist movement as a whole through books like um, Milestones. And he also influenced Azam a lot, even though uh, Qutb died early. He was, he was executed in 1966. Um, at which point Azam was only um, 25 years old, 24, 25, um, and hadn't really sort of matured intellectually himself. Um, but, uh, and then the two never met, incidentally. Um, Azam later met several members of Qutb's family, but not Said Qutb himself. Uh, but Qutb was Azam's big hero. Um, from his youth until his death, uh, and the uh, you, you find he, he, Azam quotes quote in, in many of, of, of his his writings, and uh, which is kind of interesting because Qutub is he writes mainly about how to kind of Islamize uh, you know Muslim states you know from the inside, uh, whereas Azam in the 1980s is concerned with sort of, you know, liberating Muslim, you know, occupied Muslim land from non-Muslim Muslim invaders. So it, it, there's slightly different agendas and, and Qutb never really talks much about uh, international politics. Um, uh, and, and Azam, in, in, I think in much of the academic literature, Azam is viewed as a sort of internationalist who only, who only cares about international issues. But Azam, that's not true. I mean, Azam was also very much concerned with domestic Arab politics, and he wanted to see Islamic revolutions across the Muslim world. He, he wanted to Islamize uh, or, or the entire region and even, and even kind of melt countries together into a caliphate. And so, and, and that, this sort of ideal, this objective of, of, of turning all Muslim majority societies into Islamic State, you know, with with a fairly where a fairly strict interpretation of Islamic law would be applied throughout. This is something that Azam got from 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 Qutb, uh, and of course Azam was not alone alone in that. So Azam had this sort of dual. He had this sort of, I guess, sort of dual agenda. He 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 wanted to Islamize uh, his societies and fight secularists and other kind of insufficiently religious people in his own society and he and he was keen on liberating muslim lands you know, palestine from israeli occupation so afghanistan from the soviets etc yeah and so i guess that brings us in a way to bin laden uh bin ladenism al-qaeda whichever one mm -hmm. of those you want to pick up on first. I mean, for those of us on this side of 9-11, we think of pan-Islamism as what brought us the global jihadist, you know, sort of the same idea. And talk a little bit about that relationship between local, localized um, circumstances and global circumstances and the way in which 
um, in the way in which Azam related to that and the way in which Bin Laden related to that. So sort of a, where do they join and where are they distinct? Right. Well, first a few words about their personal relationship. Um, so uh, Azam is often described as the mentor of Bin Laden, and that's largely true. He was about 15 years older, and he actually taught him for a little while in Saudi Arabia in, in, in 80, 81. And Bin Laden suddenly looked up to, to Azam. Um, and the, the two were, you know, good friends till the very end, despite what some people have written about their relationship. And I am very much, I'm very, I'm very skeptical of the notion that Bin Laden killed Azam or ordered his killing, um, because there is so much evidence suggesting that they were, you know, they were, co they were cooperating. Um, they were cooperating less in the 80s, uh, late 80s than they did in the early 80s, but still, they, you know, they were, they were definitely on speaking terms and, 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 um, and, and so they were, had a respectful relationship uh, throughout. However, um, oh, sorry, uh, so, uh, however, from the, from the mid 80s, around 86, Bin Laden, you know, is preoccupied with sort of other things than Azam uh, in Afghanistan. And, uh, and the main difference there was actually not so much in, uh, differences in strategy for kind of how to wage jihad or where to do it, but more about what the Arabs should be doing um, and how they should be training. And, and the difference was that Azam was, he was a pragmatist and, a, and, and who saw the war as a kind of a total effort that didn't necessarily only have to be about fighting. It could also be about logistical support or running orphanages and, and so on. And he was also careful, you know, he was keen on kind of respecting the Afghans and, and keeping the Afghans in authority at all times. Mm -hmm. Bin Laden, on the other hand, was <clears throat> um, more keen on f just fighting. He, he, he wanted to fight himself and, he, and he, was, he surrounded himself with other Arab recruits who, who, you know, they didn't want to sweep the floors of orphanages or, you know, drive, you know, trucks with carpets to Afghan Mujahideen and stuff like that. They wanted to go out on the battlefield and fire rounds. Um, and they found in, you know, in the early, in the sort of in the early stages of the mobilization that the Azam and his famous service bureau organization didn't provide that. They didn't get, provide enough opportunities and, 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 and enough kind of uh, adrenaline rush. Um, and so from 86, Bin Laden sets up his own training camp just on the side, other side of the border. And he, he's, he attracts others who, who, you know, who, who want to be, who want to be fighting on the front line. So, and, and so Azam, so Bin Laden just, he wanted to build like a, an Arab special force that he could be proud of. He wanted to, the Arabs to kind of stand out on the battlefield and be known for their bravery and valor. So that was that, that that was the disagreement in the 80s. It was mainly about about that. Now, uh, about the local and the global and the differences between Azam and Bin Laden. So, um, both Azam and Bin Laden, uh, uh, you know, they are preoccupied with international politics. They they want they they say that you know that they're they're very skeptical to. Muslim governments, uh, but they don't believe, at least Bin Laden didn't for, <laughs> until the mid-90s, don't believe in revolutionary activity. They think it's not because it's, uh, the objective is not right, but just because it's futile. It's just, it's just unrealistic to try and topple Muslim regimes from within. So they, so, so when we describe, when I describe this as Azam and Bin Laden, both as pan-Islamists is from that perspective, in that is that they, you know that they are they are focused on the kind of the the, the the fight on the outer border of the Islamic world, um, whereas previous militant Islamists in the in the sixties and seventies they were not concerned with that they were concerned with the in the fight on the inside, and and that's why you know Egyptian militants killed pre Egyptian President Anwar Sadat in nineteen eighty one and so on. So just so they were both. 
just yeah, one thing I just want to follow up on that because you're talking about the you know the edges of the Islamic world. But what about the West? Did they have different um, gripes with the West? Different evaluations of how to deal with the West? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I don't think there were any noticeable differences between Azam and Bin Laden with regard to the view of the West. Um, they were both very hostile to the West. They were both very anti-American uh, um, because they both they were both strongly influenced by the anti-Western discourse on the in, inside of the Muslim Brotherhood at, at the time. The, the, the mainstream Muslim Brotherhood in the 1970s and 80s was very anti-Western and 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 pedal in all kinds of conspiracy theories about the role of the West and the Jews, etc. And Azam and Bin Laden both believed in this with all their heart. And uh, even though you know, uh, Azam, for you know, pragmatic reasons, he traveled to the West. He, he, he went to America a lot. And he kind of used uh, sort of American territory to recruit and fundraise and so on. Recruit for the war in Afghanistan. Yeah, but he, he but he would he would tell like his he would tell his audience, you know, while you know he would be you know, he would speak in America and tell the audience, look, I know many of you here here, here for, for studies etc. And that's fine. But as soon as you finish your studies, you have to come back to the Muslim world. You have to come back to your go back to your countries. It's not good for you to stay here in the longer term. The society here corrupts you, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so he was he was uh, just generally skeptical of the sort of Western societal model, and he was very hostile to sort of to Western foreign policy in the region. In fact, in the late 1980s, uh, you can you almost get the sense from some of his writings and that of other Arab Afghans that the the, the Arab Afghans are at war with America. Yeah. More than with 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 the Russians, he, Azam has has a, says at one point that explicitly uh, that we we may be fighting the Russians, but now but but America is the, is a, is really the, the more important enemy, and this is like in nineteen eighty seven or eighty eight. Um, actually, that's one of the that's, that's a, a new finding in the book, just how anti-Western the Af Afghan Arabs were. Now, of course, they were not involved in terrorism against the West in that period. Uh, there, are, there, were, there, are, there are no, there, there were no Sunni Islamist terrorist attacks in the West in the 1980s at all, as far as I know. Um, now that comes after, that comes in the 90s, as many viewers will, will know, starts a little bit with a few small incidents in, 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 in the US, in New York in, in 1990, 91, you know, the World Trade Center attack in '93, and you start getting things in in Europe as well. And and of course, from the mid '90s onwards, you know, Bin Laden declares all-out war against America, and the and all of that is known. Um, so the the difference between the kind of the the ideological legacies of Azam and Bin Laden. Is, is basically a tactical one that, that, that Azam wanted Muslims to, to fight, that both wanted Muslims to fight in defense of the Ummah, to fight, to defend Muslims against external aggression. But Azam wanted that fight to happen in conflict zones, in regulated form, like, you know, to have people, you know, Fight as militias, you know, on the ground you know, against enemies in uniform and so on. Not to, and to not use, you know, out of theater operations or you know, bombs in Western capitals and such. Um, whereas Bin Laden, uh, as we know, um, adopted this international terrorism strategy, which Azam never did in his lifetime. So that's where they 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 they, part. they both share this sort of pan-Islamist outlook. The, the Muslim world is under attack, and we need to do everything we can to defend it. But they differ in their tactics. Um, now, one of the most interesting questions I think is, what would Azam have done if he had lived into the 1990s? Because 
when I notice when I made this comparison of Osama and bin Laden, it's it's anachronistic. Well, let's the, the, talk the, about let's talk about how he died because it's sure. not. It's it, you need to let's just talk about that whole moment before we move on to if you don't mind to yeah. you know the nineties and maybe even to today today because I mm -hmm. think what you're raising is one of the most interesting you know things to think about when you read this book. Um, so you begin the book with. See, this is not a spoiler alert because you begin the book with how he dies. And, and before you talk about it, I wanna just say one thing that is so interesting about this book in general is that you're very comfortable saying, and maybe this has to do with why, you know, maybe because it was so many years it took in writing the book, we don't really know what happened. And you say that mm. not just in this circumstance, which you, you know, you're, you're gonna talk about, but on, a, on several occasions in the book, like we don't actually know or at least that you convey that we there, here's all the evidence we have. Here's the best, um, the best explanation or analysis we can give. So I just wanted to preface you're talking about how, and I, I really appreciate how comfortable you are with saying we don't know, but here's what we do know. So anyway, mm. thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, and that's uh, particularly true of the assassination. Uh, which happened in November 1989, at the tail end of the Afghan Jihad. They, in fact, the Russians had already left. They left in February that year. And what was going on at that time was sort of, you know, slight, something slightly different. It was a fight against the Afghan communists. So, that, you know, people who were actually Afghans, nominally Muslim, uh, but they were, you know, in gov the government in Kabul was, was communist. So the Afghan Arabs who were left, you know, were were fighting fighting them, but it was a slightly different war. Mm -hmm. uh, and Azan and Bin Laden, in fact, he had he had already gone back to Saudi Arabia. He did that a few months earlier, as did several other Afghan Arabs. Um, so that adds to the mystery. You know, what, what, you know <laughs> who killed him and why do it then? Why do it at the tail end of the war? So that's one question. Another question is, why do it in such a, such a spectacular fashion? Because the, it, it happened uh, at around, around noon on a Friday, uh, right in front of the mosque where Azam was due to give the Friday sermon. Uh, so it was time to maximize attention. Um, there would, would there would have been hundreds of people outside the mosque, you know, waiting to get in to listen to him, and who who who, who viewed the the bombing. The bomb, by the way, was was placed under a kind of small bridge uh, over that led that that crossed it, sort of a ditch. And as Azam drove over that bridge, the 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 bomb went off under the car, killing killing them uh, almost instantly. And so, why why do it in such a spectacular way? When you you know, they can easily whoever did it could easily have done it more quietly. You know, a drive by shooting mm -hmm. on a on a remote road or something like that. Uh, so. What we have is basically a, a sort of a, a murder mystery with a lot of suspects, um, but no nobody with a with a no nobody that stands out. So a bit like you know some you know Agatha Christie novels. We have like 10, 15 people who, who who you know can all be behind it. They all have something slightly um, you know suspect about them, but none of them really stand out. That's what we have here. Um, and the list is long. This is about you know ten, fifteen people, you know, or actors. And from Bin Laden has been mentioned. I mean, the Wahiri has been mentioned. Western intel agencies have been mentioned. Uh, CIA, the Mossad has been mentioned, uh, and, and 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 several others. So, um, and of course, it's not made easier by the complete absence of forensic evidence. Um, the only, the closest thing we have are basically accounts and some drawings and some pictures of the of the of the site from afghan from afghan arabs uh, they're, 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 the, the, to, to the extent that the pakistanis investigated this they, you know, they never published 
a report or any kind of official findings. So um, it's uh, it's all kind of conjecture. I'm kind of trying to weigh, you know, who had the capability, who had the motivation. But I mean, that's not sufficient. I mean, an, an actor can have the capability and the motivation and still not be behind it. So um, it's it remains a, a a mystery. But you do have an opinion about it. That's right. So I, th I think the, the most plausible candidate, in my view, was the Pakistani ISI, Inter Services mm -hmm. Intelligence. Mm -hmm. They had the capability for sure, um, because they were operating on home turf, and they had been doing op you know, operations like that in Kabul and other places for years. Uh, they also had a motivation, I think, in that they had always been, they had long been skeptical of the Arab presence in Pakistan in general. Um, and in fact, in 1986, they tried to get Azam kicked out from Pakistan, and so on. They, I think they they viewed the Arabs as a as a as a disturbing element in the, in the area. Um, they couldn't be easily controlled, and then got up to all kinds of monkey business. And um, also, in the late 80s, Azam and other Afghan Arabs criticized Pakistan more explicitly and loudly. The right, you know critical things in Al Jihad magazine, for example, mm -hmm. critical things of Bhutto and, and Pakistani government for various reasons, including Pakistan's signing of the so-called Geneva Accords in 88, which is kind of sort of the, you know, the peace agreement for Afghanistan. And uh, the Arabs didn't like that. They thought it was a sellout. And, and finally, the Azam was involved in sort of intra-Afghan diplomacy in late 89, trying to bring Hekmatyar right. and Masood together. And you know, many people have written that ISI didn't like that because they wanted their man, who was Hekmatyar, to prevail. So you know, the, the, kind of the, the case is plausible, but I have no proof. So that brings us to what, would the, you know, what was the, the uh, loss of Azam in terms of subsequent developments? What, that's what you were talking about when you went back to this right. moment. So yeah. how do you assess that? What do you, what do you think the impact, and a couple of have sent questions to this, you know, what is the, the impact of his withdrawal from the scene, his killing? Mm. Well, um, I think um, the main uh, problem was that, the, 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 main, the main effect was that <clears throat> the, the community, the Afghan Arab community, lost the only person who could hold it together, the only, uh, the undisputed sort of authority figure. Oh, but clearly, it wasn't completely undisputed. I mean, there, there were some, there were some argue, arguing going on, but as far as, as far as, uh, you know, foreign fighter contingents and, you know, co you know, conglomerations of radicals are concerned, you know, uh, those are never easy to hold together. Azam, you know, ex exercised quite a bit of authority, and the and when when he disappeared, um, there were fewer people around to kind of you know keep the Arabs in line and and to keep them sort of focused on you know the Afghan issue and to keep them you know from overreaching, keep them from using too extreme tactics and things like that. So his, his disappearance probably accelerated the, you know, the fragmentation and the radicalization of the Afghan Arab community. But I don't want to overemphasize this because I think those processes were already in motion. In fact, they were in motion partly because of Azam's own actions. Um, and I think they would have happened anyway. Um, and I say this because um, the, I think the un, one of the underlying reasons for this fragmentation and radicalization was something, was an idea that Azam had introduced uh, a few years earlier, which was um, to say that, Muslims should wage jihad regardless of what their local authorities say. They should not listen to their local imam, they should not listen to their parents or nor their government or anyone else 
who tries to dissuade them from going to Afghanistan. Azam had said this as part of his fatwa on the Afghan Jihad on why it was a religious duty to go to Afghanistan and fight. Um, uh, and I think he, he himself didn't realize the, re the long-term repercussions of that idea. Because basically what, what it meant was that he undermined authority inside this Islamist community. That, because what, what basically, you know, if you tell someone not to listen to anyone, there may come a day when they stop listening to you as well. <laughs> and that's what happened uh, with the Afghan Arabs. And Azam, even in his lifetime, experienced some of that kind of opposition and antagonizing you know, people who didn't want to listen to him and stuff. Um, uh, and but, but later on, after it disappeared, this sort of this notion that you know, if you're a mujahid, you know, a holy warrior, you don't need to listen to anyone. You can do um, what you think is best, um, and that led to some you know militants you know you know going down you know a rabbit hole of extremism, um, you know that that we we've been unfortunate to experience in the recent decades. So. You know, so it's in the 90s, you know, after the Afghan jihad that you get, you know, some of these, you know, you know, more extreme actions, you know, the, the beheadings of soldiers in, in, in Bosnia, the massacres in Algeria, Bin Laden's, you know, terrorism against America, and then, of course, Islamic State. I think these are all kind of long-term effects of this erosion of authority uh, that, Azam himself introduced. So how would you, and a couple of people have asked this question, how do you think Azam would view, this is a big question, how do you think you would view what's happening with um, uh, jihadi extremism uh, and violence in today's world? How do you think he would view what's happening um, globally? Oh, I think he would condemn it. I think he would see it as excessively brutal, counterproductive, um, and, pro, you know, and un-Islamic, some of the, the, you know, the things that Islamic State are doing. Um, Azam wrote books about the laws of war and, and kind of the various kind of regulations of how, you know, you know li li limiting the sort of the tactical repertoire of, of, of fighters in Afghanistan. And so he, he, at least when he was alive, he was concerned with kind of tactical restraint. And um, we know, for example, that, you know, the, the people came, some people came to him with ideas for, for example, carrying out an attack in Moscow uh, that he never kind of followed up or encouraged. Uh, we, we know that, you know, you know, there were tendencies, you know, budding tendencies toward, you know, excessive violence in those days that he actively reined in. So I think if you sort of, if you froze Azam the day before his, his assassination and then unfroze him in 2015 at the height of the IS caliphate, he would be shocked and uh, horrified. Um, or maybe, you know, he would give it a few days and he, he would be intrigued because he himself wanted to see a caliphate. He, he, he wrote extensively on the need to kind of reestablish a caliphate. So he'd be curious, but I think it wouldn't have taken him very long to, to, um, to call their bluff and, and, and condemn them. Now, a bigger, a more, much more complicated question, I think, is if instead of freezing him in, in 89 and unfreezing him now, is if you let him live, if he, if he had lived in, throughout the 1990s and had the opportunity to undergo a gradual transformation, then it becomes much more complicated. Because this is what I was uh, touching on earlier, that you know, the, to compare Azam you know, in the late 80s with bin Laden you know, in the early 2000s is an anachronism. Mm -hmm. the, you know, you're comparing, you know, right. ideas from different <clears throat> eras. Yeah. If you, it's 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 more, kind of 
re more kind of relevant to compare ideas at the same time. So let's compare Azam and bin Laden at the same time. What did bin Laden say in 1889? Well, bin Laden wasn't particularly more radical than Azam in 88-89. Bin Laden was not calling for attacks against America. He was not calling for you know, international terrorist operations or anything of, 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 the, of the kind. So, but, but bin Laden changed. Bin Laden evolved. Bin Laden you know, adapted his kind of strategy and agenda to the circumstances, which was in the 90s, you know, a unipolar world with America, you know, supremely powerful on the international stage. And you know America in the Gulf War, etc., um, and also a series of wars, you know, where Muslims were being, you know, where Muslims were fighting non-Muslims, and of, many of these were on the borders of the former Soviet Union, you know, in the Balkans, in Central Asia, and so on. You you know, you had, an, you had an, an objectively speaking an increase in the number of wars involving Muslims in the uh, or kind of attacks on sort of Muslim territories in the 1990s. And these, I think, can, you know, radicalized bin Laden and, and fueled support for him. They, I mean, they, they verified the sort of siege mentality that, he, that they had been kind of promoting. So, what, so it's not inconceivable that if Azam had lived through this, and if he, Azam had seen the U.S. deployment of forces to Saudi Arabia in 1990, if he'd seen the Bosnia War, if he'd seen you know, the, event, the events in Palestine, etc., that he might also have radicalized and, and, you know, and, and, and come to support more, more radical methods. That is a much more open question, I think. And in, on this point, I, I guess I sort of, I maybe kind of, I, I argue a little bit against sort of the conventional wisdom in at least in academic circles until recently, which has been that Azam is, you know, is is this essentially moderate resistance fighter who, you know, who who, you know, who did not have it in him to to go more radical or to go Al Qaeda. Um, I, I'm I'm less certain. I think he, he, he had it in him under the right circumstances. It may not be the most likely scenario, but I think it, you know, we, can't, we can't exclude it. Because Azam was saying some pretty, uh, you know, he's on the record with some fairly radical statements in the, in the 80s as well. For example, in 88, he was in America speaking to, in a mosque in California, and he, someone asked, is it okay to kill Jews here in America? He says, of course it is. Things like that. And um, so, it's complicated. <laughs> Let's talk about his relationship with the United States a little bit. He's here a lot, as you say. He's here to recruit for the Afghan war. Um, did he have a relationship with the US government? Does he have, what, what are his relationships with the United States in general? Can you talk a little bit about that? And tell us about Cat Stevens, because everybody wants to know about Cat Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, as you, as you know, one of the most popular kind of narratives or theories about the, the whole Afghan jihad is that the CIA created Al-Qaeda and that, you know, the U.S. government, you know, was basically funding and organizing uh, bin Laden, Azam, and all the other Af Afghan Arabs in order to fight the Soviet Union and that this was, you know, very stupid because then the same people attacked America later. Um, and so you will find claims uh, all over that Azam worked with uh, the U.S. government, and um, but um, this is not true in my uh, view. I mean, I, I haven't many of these sort of claims that they, they come from one particular book called *Unholy Wars* by John Cooley. Mm -hmm. um, which you know, people cited because you know it looks academic. It's a, it's a book, um, but if you look at Cooley's sources, there there's nothing there. He claims things and he writes things. You know, they're so specific that you think, oh, it's so specific. It has to be, you know, he can't have invented this one. And I don't know if he invented it or if he had sources that told him things. But it's a fact that his many of his claims regarding the U.S. government support for the Afghan Arabs 
they are not sourced. So, and I have not found any sources, written or oral, otherwise, first-hand sources that confirm a kind of a working relationship between Azam and the U.S. government. And other people have tried to dig up the same. And you know, Peter Bergen has has written this as well. I think Stephen Cole has has too. And you know, the you know the, the most you know the strongest skeptics might say, oh yeah, well you're you're all you know you're you're say to Pete, Steve Cole and Peter Bergen, oh, you're Americans, uh, of course you will say this, you know, you, will, you want to protect the reputation of your country, you're biased, you're, you know, you're, you're lying, basically. But I think that's not reasonable. I mean, I think all of us would have, we would have strong incentives to report this if we found it. It would please me, nothing, little will please me more if I were the first person to find, you know, a document, you know, that proved an Azam CIA connection, it would make me famous. Uh, you know, to bring me on, on, you know, on CNN and stuff. So, Very famous. You have like 200 people listening, so it <laughs> makes you famous. Go ahead. Thank you. But the, point, but the point is that there is no evidence and um, logic, you know, works against it because um, and people have an, have an incentive to report it. And also, if you look at it more closely, the U.S. government didn't really have an incentive to work with Azam. Why would they work with Azam? Um, bear, bear in mind that you know the U.S. you know is in it's fighting is in the Cold War with, with the Soviet Union. This is a big geopolitical game. You know they're not they're not you know counting cents and dollars here. They're counting you know millions of dollars. You know, and and they're 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 working with hundred dollar bills, not single lower notes. So so and whereas the, the African Arabs were very few in number. Uh, there were just a few thousand compared to, you know, somewhere between 100 and 200,000 Afghan Mujahideen. So the, Af the Afghan, the Arabs were, you know, minuscule and they were terrible fighters. They had, most of them had little military background. They were in poor physical shape. Many of them from the Gulf where there's, you know, not really a sports culture. And the sources, by the way, complain, you know, from the time, you know, point this out that the Arabs were, unfit for fighting. So why exactly would the US support, you know, or spend time and energy, you know, bringing these Afghans to, to Afghanistan? It makes no sense to me. Also, I would say that if the US government had put its, its heart into bringing, uh, you know, foreign fighters to Afghanistan, I think we, we should have seen a lot more of them. You know, if, uh, if the you know, U.S. administration with all its resources wanted, you know, foreign volunteers there, I think they would have succeeded in bringing just more than just a few thousand, which is the number that ended up going. So, uh, so I, I find no evidence that Azam worked with, with you, the U.S. government, either in Pakistan, Afghanistan, or when he was in, in, in the U.S. I fired... Uh, the agencies. Uh, the CIA didn't reply, but the FBI sent me a bunch of documents from the late 80s, which uh, suggest to me that they had, they were not very, they're not following us on very closely. What they had was very limited and the you know, other questions going back and forth. And who is this guy? Do we have anything, etc. So they were probably, you know, the agencies, some of the agencies were probably aware that he was you know, coming to the country and running around preaching and that he, you know, they knew that he was a leader of the services bureau, a prominent Arab, etc. But, but I, I the, the fact that they were aware of it doesn't mean that they were actively collaborating. Well, you didn't tell us about Cat Stevens, but before you do, let me just tell everybody, don't forget that Q&A button on the bottom. If you have questions, uh, let me know. Now, the Cat Stevens part. Right. Yeah, so um, um, Cat Stevens, of course, as, as many know, converted to Islam in the late 70s. And he um, spent much of his time in the 80s in building a charity called Muslim Aid. Uh, so he basically took the money he earned from his music uh, to help you know, Muslims around the world, you know, development projects, you know, uh, emergency uh, aid and so on. And in the late 80s, or actually in the mid 80s, Cat Stevens wanted 
or Yusuf Islam, as he called himself then, um, wanted to set up an operation in Peshawar, Pakistan, to help Afghan refugees. And uh, if you, you know, came to Peshawar as a, you know, as a as a, as a non-Pakistani Muslims, chances were that you would run into Azam uh, because he was sort of, he, he had been there, he came, he had come early, so he was kind of a, you know, a well-known figure and he was, he was running his own organization, the Services Bureau, which had an NGO aspect to it. They were running, as I said, orphanages and um, supplying aid to refugees and, you know, running schools, etc. And um, so I don't know exactly how they kind of connected, like the, how the first connection was made, but I think it's likely that, you know, they came in, in, in the context of them both being involved in NGO work in Peshawar. And uh, in 1986, I think uh, uh, Cat Stevens goes several times to Peshawar, but in, in 86, he gives an interview to, with Azam to Al Jihad magazine, yeah. and uh, he's, he features even on the front page of Al Jihad magazine. Um, and even more interestingly, uh, we we find also in this magazine uh, ads for cassette tapes with jihadi music or jihadi, the so-called anashid that Cass Stevens had recorded. So basically, Azam and the Services Bureau sold cassette tapes with Cat Stevens music. Uh, I, I doubt they got very much money out of that, but it's a, it's a fun, fun fact. It Incidentally, I'll, I'll just add here that, you know, it's, this is particularly interesting and, and it kind of, it, it sheds light on an episode that some people may remember from the immediate post 9-11 era when Cat Stevens was denied entry to the US. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, I haven't gone back and looked at the precise things that were said at the time, but I seem to sort of remember that 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 Cat Stevens, you know, sort of said that he couldn't understand why this was happening, that it kind of proved the anti-Muslim bias of the U.S. government. But I think, you know, knowing that he had been on the front page of Al Jihad magazine and so on, you know, it's you know, you, you could kind of under, you could be, you could disagree with the decision not to let him in, but you can kind of see where it's coming from. It's probably there. We have a bunch of interesting questions. I've been trying to weave them in as I talk, but now I'm just going to ask them straight, okay? Um, especially because this one starts with, I am thoroughly enjoying your book. Good thing, right? Uh, can you Thank comment you. on the reaction of Azam to the Iranian revolution and his relationship with the Islamic regime there? Sure. So <clears throat> we have a testimony from December 19... 79, uh, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, it's from none other than Rashid Ghanoushi, the kind of grand old man of Tunisian Islamism, sort of the leader of the Tunisian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. who's currently Speaker of Parliament, by the way, in Tunisia. Now, in 1979, Azam and Ghanoushi were together in a conference in Italy. And Ghanoushi says, in one of the several op-eds that he or obituaries that he wrote when Azam died in 1989, he writes that you know he remembers you know I was with I was with the uh, Dal Azam you know at the time of the Iranian Revolution and remember that he was so enthusiastic about this and he couldn't stop talking he wouldn't talk about anything else. Um, and we also have other sources to say that to, to suggest that, that Azam was very enthusiastic in the beginning about the Iranian revolution. Mm -hmm. And this was, by the way, not unheard of in the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim, you know, there were several others in the Brotherhood who were, who were kind of intrigued uh, and uh, enthusiastic about the revolution, not because they were directly involved in the project or necessarily kind of, you know, shared the exact agenda of the Iranian revolutionaries, but mostly just because it kind of, it was an, 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 an analogy to what they wanted to achieve. They wanted to achieve the same thing in their Sunni majority countries. Mm -hmm. And they probably thought that, you know, if this was happening in Iran, it can happen uh, with us as well. 
Now, that early enthusiasm or, or kind of, uh, yeah, or sort of, um, kind of uh, interest in the Iranian revolution died down fairly quickly. So after a few years, Azam and other Muslim brothers were less, much less enthusiastic and, and kind of, uh, you know, had a different kind of more pragmatic view, view of it. And Azam, he didn't really write very much about the Iranian, about Iran in the later in the 80s. Um, I think he, he came to sort of view, he came to view Iran as just another, um, you know, yeah. kind of another regime in the region. And like all regimes, uh, you know, it was pragmatic, you can't really, can't really trust it, uh, and so on. So, and he, to my knowledge, he had no dealings with the Iranian regime directly. Um, okay. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in right now. So, um, in your view, is there an ideological successor to Azam in this era? If so, who is it? Um, well, and, and as, a, as just a tie into that, two people actually asked, what about his influence right now? So if it's not, so if the question is, you know, if there's a successor, who is it? But also, how do we see the legacy of his thought in today's context? Is it there? And you talked about the meme, so coming back to that. Right. Well, so the two questions are connected. So I'm glad you, you raised them together because who you view as his as his successor depends on what you see as his legacy what you what you see as his sort of um the essence of his project and um one of the peculiar one of the fascinating things about Islam is that he is claimed by so many different groups and movements mm -hmm. um He's, he's claimed both by you know relatively moderate Muslim Brotherhood figures who who hate Al Qaeda um, uh, and by Al Qaeda and by Islamic State and by Hamas. Uh, so he's 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 claimed by a range of different groups whose agendas are mutually incompatible. They cannot all be right in saying that oh, they represent his continuation. So, and I think the reason why he has this status is that he died before he could say anything that committed himself to any one of the sub branches of jihadi strategy that emerged in the 1990s. He died, he basically most, he, 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 he said only sort of common denominator things. Um, he, he never, he was never faced, you know, with, you know, the, the strategic debates that emerged in the 90s and never had to take a stand in those. And so he's on, he's only on the record with um, kind of sort of you know, boilerplate formulations about the necess necessity of jihad, the duty for of Muslims to defend Muslim territory, things that very, you know, a lot of people can agree on. And that's why I think he's so widely acclaimed. So who you consider as his continuation today depends on sort of who you ask. But if you ask me, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it, I think he probably has had several successors. I, um, basically, I see Azam as sort of the, you know, a fairly sort of, uh, you know, a fairly hardline Islamic resistance fighter but one that, you know, wants to fight in conflict zones um, and that want to sort of, you know, make a difference to, you know, um, uh, to, to these, you know, basically Islamic sort of liberation struggles um, by connecting them with the outside world. So you have people like Ibn, like Ibn Khattab in Chechnya, for example, Anwar Shaban in, Bos in Bosnia, um, I'm not sure who it would have been in the Iraq war, but in the Syria war, there are figures like Abdullah al muhaysini who some people have even referred to explicitly as the Abdullah Azam of the, of the Syrian Jihad. Um, so that's kind of, uh, I think that's, that's, you know, that's, that's a fair claim, but other people will have other views about who represents Azam's place. Another um, interesting question kind of along those lines is, could you please talk 
more about Azam's vision of building a caliphate. Did he believe in a pan-Muslim caliphate that would dissolve existing national borders? Just, you know, in terms of how we think of the caliphate today, how, how as sort of one, you know, sort of big pan-Islamist, you know, geographical area, how did he think about it? Right. Um, uh, he wanted the pan-Islamic, the large, the large version. He, he wanted basically uh, a, 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 a new modern version of the Ottoman Caliphate. Hassan was very nostalgic about the Ottoman Caliphate. That's one of the reasons, and he wrote extensively about that. That's one of the reasons he's, he's very popular in Turkey, even today. Um, uh, he, he thought that uh, the, the Ottoman Caliphate was 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 a was a good um, uh, arrangement. It had its weaknesses, but but it was much better than what came after, in, in his view. Uh, and he wanted to, you know, in, in the long term, he wanted to reestablish something similar, uh, and uh, uh, to have a, you know, to erase national borders. Uh, he, Azam never sort of truly recognized uh, the post-Ottoman order in the Middle East and the, the various boundaries of the region. He considered all the nation states as basically, you know, it's essentially illegitimate to kind of, you know, modern inventions. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if he had sort of been put in power, you know, <laughs> as, sort of, as, as sort of caliph of the Muslim world, you know, at the time he would have, he would he would have raised all those borders, and created this sort of macro state. Of course, you know, he he knew that that couldn't you know couldn't be achieved, you know, uh, realistically in a short period of time. So he had he had a, he also had kind of a more short and medium term vision for this and that was to establish an Islamic state in Afghanistan right. and there's a very interesting interview from the late 80s with Azam's right hand Tamim al-Adnani who I think was speaking for Azam when he said that what you know what they wanted this is the uh, Azam and Tamimi was you know a state for Sunnis, there could be for Sunni Muslims what Iran was to Shiite Muslims. They wanted basically a, a Sunni Iran in Afghanistan. That's what they wanted in the short term. Which is, in my view, the Taliban. Uh, they wanted a Taliban-like state in Afghanistan in the short term. That's what they wanted. That's what kind of what they were fighting for in Afghanistan at the time. And I think Azam would have embraced the, the, the Taliban uh, in the 90s if he had, he had lived. And so, but then his long-term view was that this, you know, Islamic State in Afghanistan would later expand. It would sort of attract, you know, committed good Muslims who would, you know, gradually and under the right circumstances expand its territorial uh, scope and eventually kind of help, you know, reconquer Palestine, etc. Okay, we have time for one more question and then quick closing remark. How do you think Azam would have got America into the fight? Outside of his own 9-11, what would have been done to get American boots on the ground against his Mujahideen? Mujahideen, I never say that right. <laughs> That's very difficult to say because I, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the notion that uh, Azam would kind of go global and join Al Qaeda, it's 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 conceivable, but it's it's I wouldn't say it's very likely, and he'd never explicitly discussed this, um, so it's difficult to say. Um, Azam was relatively pragmatic; he was quite you know, well read. He, I, I, I doubt he would have made the same you know kind of mistake that that. Uh, that Bin Laden did by uh, with the 9/11 attacks because it was, I think, a strategic mistake for Al Qaeda. So, um, so we always end these events with the same um, question, always virtual or unvirtual, okay. whatever that is. Um, which is, it, can you give us something hopeful about the world of of that you live in, studying terrorism? Is there something optimistic we could see on the future, constructive uh, steps that are being taken to make this a more peaceful environment? Um, anything, I'll take anything. 
Sure. Um, the jihadi movement today is weaker than it was five years ago. So we can say it peaked in the mid 2010s, you know, with the caliphate and all that. But now uh, the movement as a whole you know, is substantially weaker, and it has its its capable its ability to influence people through propaganda is much weaker because of all the things that have been done on the internet to limit propaganda. And um, I think it's hard to overstate. I mean, if, if we are able to kind of keep the internet free of jihadi propaganda, I think that could be a game changer um, because that's how these ideas, you know, spread. Mm -hmm. If you don't, have this material readily available, then it's much harder for you know, radical groups to grow. So it's a bit like you know the invention of the book or you know, pamphlets or all these sort of textual technologies. So these technologies for transmitting texts and ideas, I think, are absolutely crucial to the rise and spread of radical movements. And if you take that away, then it becomes much harder for them. Now, the problem is that it is going to be very difficult to, to do that because you know, non-state actors always find ways uh, to kind of avoid state repression in this domain. But at this point, is you know we're doing pretty well, um, and I think, as I said, if we, if we can maintain this, that could be a game changer. So we'll have to bring you back. We'll have to do a little discussion about jihadist propaganda and ways of countering it, blocking it, whatever it is. That's a whole other thing. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts. So we've come to the end of our time. I cannot tell you how many people wrote and said they can't wait to buy this book and read it. So this is oh, good. This is, fantastic. This thanks. Is, well, thanks to yeah. everyone for, for listening in. <laughs> um, let me, let me um, tell our listeners, um, I said it yesterday, I'll repeat it again. We are starting a podcast. Um, I think it launches next week. We will keep you posted. Um, meanwhile, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. I love the way you think. Just the whole exposure to the way your, your, your mind puts together intent, context, history is just fantastic. I think we're all going to do a better job at work today than we would have done before this. So thank you thank very, you. very much, much for joining us. And, um, and we look forward to having you back. And please stay safe in Norway. Likewise. Bye-bye-bye. Bye-bye.